J.B.S. Haldane, at the end of a famous essay on possible worlds, wrote, Now my own suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. I suspect that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of or can be dreamed of in any philosophy. Haldane was one of the greatest biologists of the 20th century and certainly one of the most versatile. The late Douglas Adams, author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, made a living from the strangeness of science, pushing it to the point of comedy, which in certain parts of science is the only place you can push it, I sometimes feel. The following is taken from an extempore speech in Cambridge in 1998, which I had the good fortune to attend. The fact that we live at the bottom of a deep gravity well on the surface of a gas-covered planet going around a nuclear fireball 90 million miles away and think this to be normal is some indication of how skewed our perspective tends to be. (laughs) Where other science fiction writers played on the oddness of science to arouse our sense of the mysterious, Adams used it to make us laugh. And as I said, that may be the only response other than to cry, at least where some of the paradoxes of modern physics are concerned. Quantum physics, that flagship theory of 20th century science, makes brilliantly successful predictions. Richard Feynman compared its precision, its accuracy, to predicting a distance as great as the width of North America to an accuracy of the width of one human hair. That means, that predictive success means, that quantum theory has got to be true in some sense, as true as anything we know, including the most down-to-earth common sense facts. Yet the assumptions that quantum theory needs to make in order to deliver those predictions are so mysterious that even Feynman himself was moved to remark, if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. (laughs) Quantum theory is so queer that physicists resort to one or another paradoxical interpretation of it. And resort is the right word. David Deutsch, in this splendid book, The Fabric of Reality, embraces the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory. Because the worst you can say about that is that it's preposterously wasteful. It postulates a vast and rapidly growing number of universes existing in parallel, mutually undetectable, except through the narrow porthole of quantum mechanical experiments. In some of these universes, I'm already dead. In a minority of them, I have a green beard, and so on. The alternative Copenhagen interpretation is equally preposterous. In this case, it's not wasteful, just shatteringly paradoxical. Erwin Schrödinger satirized it with his parable of the cat. As you know, Schrödinger's cat was shut up in a box with a killing mechanism triggered by a quantum mechanical event. Before we open the lid of the box, we don't know whether the cat is dead. Common sense tells us that, nevertheless, even before we open the lid of the box, the cat must be either dead or alive. But the Copenhagen interpretation says that all that exists before we open the box is a probability. As soon as we open the box, the wave function collapses, the cat is dead or the cat is alive. Until we opened the box, it was neither dead nor alive. Well, the the many worlds interpretation of that would be that in some universes the cat is dead and in other universes the cat is alive. Neither of those interpretations satisfies human common sense or intuition. The more macho physicists say this is of no importance. What matters is that the mathematics work. The predictions are experimentally fulfilled. Most of us are too wimpish to follow them. We seem to need some sort of common sense visualization of what's really going on, and the really is in quotes. I believe, by the way, that Schrodinger originally proposed his cat thought experiment in order to highlight the absurdity of the Copenhagen interpretation. The biologist Lewis Wolpert believes that the queerness of modern physics is just the tip of the iceberg. All science is queer. 
all science, as opposed to technology, is liable to do violence to common sense. And a favorite example of his is this. Every time you drink a glass of water, the odds are that you will imbibe at least one molecule that passed through the bladder of Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> it's just elementary probability theory. The number of molecules per glassful is hugely greater than the number of glassfuls in the world and than the number of bladders full in the world. So every time we have a full glass or a full bladder, we're looking at a rather high proportion of the molecules of water that exist in the world. By the way, of course, there's nothing special about Oliver Cromwell or bladders. You have just breathed in a nitrogen atom that passed through the right lung of the third iguanodon to the left of the tall cycad tree. T.H. <laughs> Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, seemed to say the opposite. He said, science is nothing but trained and organized common sense, differing from the latter only as a veteran may differ from a raw recruit and its methods differ from those of common sense only as far as the guardsman's cut and thrust differ from the manner in which a savage wields his club. I think there's no real contradiction. Aspects of the scientific method are organized common sense, but in the framing of hypotheses, which is a very important part of the scientific enterprise, and sometimes in their testing, the greatest scientists deploy a wildness of imagination which, in the case of, a, of an Einstein or a Heisenberg, outclasses the best science fiction. I think reveling in the absurd is something that a great scientist probably does. I'm not a physicist, and I've already trespassed dangerously into the territory of what they might see as the senior science. For the rest of the lecture, I'm going to stick to biology, especially evolution. The evolution of complex life, its very existence in a universe obeying physical laws, is wonderfully surprising, or would be but for the fact that surprise is an emotion that can exist only in a brain which is the product of that very surprising process. There is an anthropic sense, then, in which, by definition, it shouldn't be surprising, because, after all, here we are being surprised, but I'd like to think that I speak for my fellow humans in insisting, nevertheless, that it is desperately surprising. Our existence is desperately surprising. On one planet, and possibly only one planet in the entire universe, molecules, which would normally make nothing more complicated than a chunk of rock, have somehow managed to gather themselves together into chunks of rock-sized matter of such staggering complexity that they're capable of swimming, flying, seeing, hearing, copulating, capturing and eating other such animated chunks of complexity, capable, in some cases, of thinking and feeling and falling in love with yet other chunks of complex matter. We now understand essentially how the trick is done, but only since 1859. Before 1859, it would have seemed very, very odd indeed. Now it is merely very odd. <laughs> the 1859 trick was, of course, Charles Darwin's. Evolution by natural selection is much misunderstood, perhaps wantonly and deliberately so, as a theory of chance. Really, of course, the essential part of the theory is the very opposite of chance. Chance enters into it in a minor capacity, in the form of random mutations, which are the ultimate source of variation in the gene pool. Without mutation topping up the variation, which is then shuffled through the gene pool by its sexual reproduction, natural selection would have nothing to work on. But the driving engine of evolution, especially in adaptive directions, is natural selection. And natural selection is about as far from random chance as you can get. Natural selection is the non-random survival of coded instructions for building bodies that make more instructions like the originals. These coded instructions resemble computer viruses in that they say, copy me. Computer viruses are well named. A biological virus, like the measles or flu virus, consists of almost nothing more than its genome. And its genome is pretty much just a coded 
program that says copy me. And computer viruses are the same thing written in computer language. In the realm of life, viruses are just a special case. The reductio to almost pure software. Big animals like us, or gorillas or rhinoceroses, are just a more elaborate version of the same thing. A rhinoceros genome, like a flu virus genome, is a copy me program. But the rhinoceros genome says, copy me by the almost unbelievably roundabout route of building a rhinoceros first. <laughs> If that isn't queerer than we can suppose, it's surely a lot queerer than most of us ever have supposed. The rhinoceros is a giant robot programmed to lumber around the world, eating plants, mating with other rhinos, and spreading more copies of the genes that did the programming. Sycamore genes are doing the same thing by an equally roundabout route, which is different in detail from the rhino route. Gorilla genes are doing the same thing by yet another roundabout route, which again is different in detail. Those details are secondary. Oak tree or orangutan, bacterium or bonobo, DNA is just DNA, and its coded instructions translate into protein following a universal code, all but universal code. The machine code of every form of life that's ever been examined, unlike, say, the machine code of a Mac and an IBM PC, is the same. The high-level software for building a rhino or a rosebush is different, but the machine code is identical. Now, Building a bacterium is a far quicker, less roundabout, more efficient way to propagate building instructions. So you might say, why aren't we all bacteria? And the short answer is that most of us are. We large creatures are just the tip of life's iceberg, and we mostly consist of bacteria anyway. There's a kind of piggybacking. When all the easy ways of making a living have been used up, natural selection finds slightly more elaborate ways of exploiting those that chose the easy ways. And then, when those slightly more elaborate trades have been filled, natural selection finds even more elaborate trades to exploit them, and so on. There's a gradual escalation to levels of complexity which would seem very queer indeed if we didn't understand the gradual cumulative process that gave rise to them. But we need a bit more of an explanation for the extreme complexity of organisms and elaborate beauty of the illusion of design. Why are animals not just competent at what they do? Why are they so shatteringly good at it? I think the one good reason for it, at any rate, is arms races. The reason carnivores run fast is that their prey run fast. And the reason prey animals run fast is that their predators run fast. Both carnivores and their prey would be better gene-propagating machines if they could divert resources away from the leg and back muscles that make them run fast and instead into making babies. But they can't do that because individuals within their species that did that would get eaten first. And so it's not possible to divert resources away from servicing the arms race. The arms race between predators and prey and the arms race between parasites and hosts pushes organisms towards ever more extravagant evolutionary investment, economic investment, in outwitting each other and further away from a comfortable optimum that they would prefer, just get, getting on with reproduction, they would prefer in all other respects. Why do trees grow so tall? Because their natural habitat is a forest where rival trees shade them. Trees grow tall solely to overtop other trees. But that was a digression. I was talking about evolutionary arms races as the explanation for not just the running speeds of predators and prey, gazelles and cheetahs, just about every example you can think of where a living thing, or a bit of a living thing, is beautiful, complicated, or dripping with the illusion of deliberate design. Eyes and ears, hands and claws, stings and wings. With 
exceptions that I won't go into, although they're deeply revealing, living things look as if they've been designed and delicately tuned by a master engineer. That complexity, especially the sensitive fine-tuning, it's, I think, mostly because they're the end products of evolutionary arms races. And what I want to suggest to you is that if we didn't know that biological evolution was true, if we weren't witnessing it as end products of it, we'd think it was science fiction. Queerer than we can suppose. What is it that makes us capable of supposing anything? And does this tell us anything about what we can suppose? Are there things about the universe that will be forever beyond our grasp but not beyond the grasp of some superior intelligence? Are there things about the universe that are in principle ungraspable by any mind, however superior? It's worth recalling Wittgenstein's remark on the question of why common sense is surprised to learn that uh, the, the earth spins rather than the sun goes round the earth. Tell me, Wittgenstein asked a friend, Why do people say it was natural for man to assume that the sun went round the earth rather than that the earth was rotating? His friend replied, well, obviously, because it just looks as though the sun is going round the earth. And Wittgenstein responded, and you have to think about this, Wittgenstein said, well, what would it have looked like if it had looked as though the earth was rotating? In the world in which our brains evolved, extremely large objects are less likely to move than small objects. As the world rotates, objects that seem large because they're near, mountains, trees, buildings, etc., all move in exact synchrony with each other relative to heavenly bodies such as the sun. Because the sun and stars seem small by comparison, our evolved brains invent an illusion of movement onto them. And the point I now want to make is a generalization of that. The way we see the world, the reason why we find some things intuitively easy to grasp and others hard, is that our brains are themselves evolved organs. They are evolved to survive in a world where the objects that mattered to our survival were neither very large nor very small, where they either stood still or moved slowly compared with the speed of light, and where the very improbable could safely be treated as impossible. Science has taught us, against all intuition, that apparently solid things, like crystals and rocks, are really composed almost entirely of empty space. And the familiar illustration is a fly in the center of a sports stadium. The fly is in the center of a sports stadium, and the whole of the empty space between the center of this sports stadium and the next sports stadium, where, where there's another fly, is represents the distance between one atomic nucleus and another. The hardest, solidest, densest rock is, quote, really almost entirely empty space, broken only by tiny particles so widely spaced they shouldn't count. Why then do rocks look and feel solid and hard and impenetrable? I don't know how Wittgenstein would have answered that question, but as an evolutionist, I want to answer it something like this. Our brains have evolved to help our bodies find their way around a world on the scale at which our bodies operate. We never evolved to navigate in the world of atoms. If we had, our brains probably would perceive rocks as full of empty space. Rocks feel hard and impenetrable to our hands because other objects like our hands can't penetrate them. It's therefore useful for our brains to construct notions like solidity, hardness, impenetrability, because such notions help us to navigate our bodies through the middle-sized world, middle-sized, relatively slow-moving world in which we have to navigate. The other end of the scale, our ancestors also never had to navigate through the cosmos. If they had, our brains would be much better at coping with Einstein. Our ancestors only ever had to navigate near the middle of the scale of sizes, larger than the atomic scale, smaller than the cosmic scale. 
Our brains are therefore good at coping with intuitive physics on that medium scale. And I want to give the name Middle World, not Middle Earth, that's Tolkien, Middle World, to the medium-scaled environment in which we've evolved the ability to take action. We find it intuitively easy to grasp ideas like when a rabbit moves at the sort of medium velocity at which middle-sized objects like rabbits do move in middle world. When it hits another solid middle world object like a rock, it knocks itself out. We can't cope with much higher velocities such as the speed of light. We can only put numbers on them, do mathematics on them. Our brains are not equipped to imagine traveling near the speed of light. Nor are we equipped to imagine what it would be like to be a neutrino passing through a rock in the vast interstices of which the rock consists. We are evolved denizens of middle world, and that limits what we're capable of imagining. Unaided human intuition, schooled in middle world, finds it hard to believe Galileo when he tells us that a heavy object and a light object, air friction aside, would hit the ground at the same moment. That's because in middle world, air friction always is there. If we'd evolved in a vacuum, we would expect them to hit the ground simultaneously. There is a sense in which animals like us have to survive not just in middle world, but in the micro world of atoms and electrons too. The very nerve impulses with which we do our thinking and our imagining depend upon activities in, middle, in, mi in micro world. But no action that we take using our muscles and our decision-making brains, would be aided by an understanding of micro-world. If we were bacteria, constantly buffeted by thermal movement of molecules, it would be different. Darcy Thompson, the, the great Scottish biologist, uh, drew attention to this in Growth and Form. He said, Life has a range of magnitude narrow indeed compared to that with which physical science deals. But it is wide enough to include three such discrepant conditions as those in which a man, an insect, and a bacillus have their being and play their several roles. Man is ruled by gravitation and rests on Mother Earth. A water beetle finds the surface of a pool a matter of life and death, a perilous entanglement or an indispensable support. In a third world, where the bacillus lives, gravitation is forgotten. And the viscosity of the liquid, the resistance defined by Stokes law, the molecular shocks of the Brownian movement, doubtless also the electric charges of the ionized medium, make up the physical environment and have their potent and immediate influence on the organism. The predominant factors are no longer those of our scale. We have come to the edge of a world of which we have no experience and where all our preconceptions must be recast. Steve Grant's book, Creation and How to Make It, is almost scathing about our human preoccupation with matter itself. We have this tendency to think that only solid, material things are really things at all. Waves of electromagnetic fluctuation in a vacuum seem unreal, and Victorians thought they were so unreal that they actually had to invent a material medium, the luminiferous ether, in order for the waves to have something to wave in. We find real matter comforting only because we have evolved to survive in middle world where matter is a useful fiction. But a whirlpool, Steve Grant points out, is a thing with just as much reality as a rock or a hurricane is, even though the matter in the whirlpool or the hurricane is continually changing. Nevertheless, it has a coherent shape. It is a thing. In a desert plain in Tanzania, in the shadow of the volcano Aldonio Lengai, there's a dune, a sand dune, made of volcanic ash from the eruption of the volcano in 1969. It has been carved into shape by the wind. But the beautiful thing is that it moves bodily. It's what's technically known as a barkan. The entire dune walks across the desert in a westerly direction at a speed of about 17 meters per year, retaining its crescent shape, moving in the direction of the horns of the crescent. The wind blows the sand up the shallow slope on the other side, and then as each sand grain hits the top of the ridge, it cascades down the steeper slope 
on the inside of the crescent, and so the crescent shape is maintained. A barkan is more of a thing than a wave, in a sense. I mean, a wave seems to move horizontally across the open sea, but the molecules of water actually move up and down vertically. Steve Grand points out that you and I are more like a wave than a permanent thing. He invites us to think of an experience from your childhood, something you remember clearly, something you can see, feel, maybe even smell, as if you were really there. After all, you really were there at the time, weren't you? How else would you remember it? But here is the bombshell. You weren't there. Not a single atom that is in your body today was there when that event took place. Matter flows from place to place and momentarily comes together to be you. Whatever you are, therefore, you are not the stuff of which you are made. If that doesn't make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, read it again until it does, because it is important. That was Steve Grand. So, really, is a word that we shouldn't use except with caution. We shouldn't use it with simple confidence. If a neutrino had a brain which had evolved in neutrino-sized ancestors, it would say that rocks really do consist mostly of empty space. We have brains that evolved in medium-sized ancestors which couldn't walk through rocks. So our really is a really in which rocks are solid. Really for an animal is whatever its brain needs it to be in order to assist its survival. And because different species live in such different worlds, there will be a discomforting range, a discomforting variety of realies. What we see of the real world, in a sense, is not the unvarnished real world, but a model of the real world, regulated and adjusted by sense data, but constructed so it's useful for dealing with the real world. The nature of the model in our head depends on the kind of animal we are. A flying animal is going to need a different kind of model, a different kind of world model in its brain from a walking, a climbing, or a swimming animal. Predators need a different kind of model from prey, even though the world itself may be the same. A monkey's brain must have software capable of simulating a three-dimensional maze of branches and trunks. A, a water boatman's brain doesn't need 3D software since it lives on the surface of a pond, a sort of Edwin Abbott flatland world. A mole software for constructing models of its world will presumably be customized for underground use. And a naked mole rat, though not closely related to a mole, probably has similar world representing software. But a squirrel, though a rodent like a naked mole rat, probably has world representing software that's more like a monkey's. I speculated before that bats may, quote, see color with their ears. The world model that a bat needs in order to navigate successfully through three dimensions catching insects at high speed must be similar to the world model that a swallow needs to perform much the same tasks. The fact that the bat uses echoes to input the current variables to update its model and keep it current, keep it in, in, confor in conformity with the, the real things out there, while the swallow uses light for the same purpose, is incidental. Bats, I'm suggesting, use perceived hues, such as red and blue, as labels for some useful aspect of echoes, perhaps the acoustic texture of surfaces, uh, just as swallows use the same perceived hues to label long and short wavelengths of light. There's nothing about long wavelength of light that says it has to be the hue red which you and I perceive. The hue red that you and I perceive is an internal label constructed by our brains for the useful purpose of differentiating light of different wavelengths. And my suggestion is that since bats need to use labels inside their heads as internal reference labels for different, say, textures, a hairy texture versus a smooth texture, of an, of an echoing surface, of a surface that is reflecting echoes, why would they not use the same labels as we use, red, blue, green, etc., for that purpose? That, of course, is pure speculation, and I suspect it's totally untestable, but I think it's highly plausible.
and the general point anyway, whether you believe that or not, is that the nature of the model in an animal's head is governed by how it is to be used rather than by the sensory modality, whether it's uh, hearing or sight, whatever it is that happens to be being used. So that's the general lesson of the, of the speculation about the bats. Our toe, when we stub our toe, our toe consisting mostly of empty space meets hard resistance when we stub it against a rock, also consisting mostly of empty space, because forces associated with the atoms in the two solids interact in such a way as to prevent them from passing through each other. And it's for this reason I'm suggesting that iron and stone look and seem solid to us, because they serve our brains most usefully if they construct an illusion of solidity. J.B.S. Haldane, in the same article on possible worlds that gave me my title, had something relevant to say about smell, about animals whose world is dominated by smell. He noted that dogs can distinguish two very similar fatty acids, each very, very heavily diluted, caprylic acid and caproic acid, and you see the, um, the molecular structure of those um, two molecules up there. The only difference is that caprylic acid has two more carbon atoms in the main chain than caproic acid. Now, Haldane guessed that a dog, quote, would be able to place the acids with an even number of carbon atoms in the order of their molecular weights by their smells, just as a man could place a number of piano wires in the order of their lengths by means of their notes. Now, there's another related fatty acid called capric acid, which is like the other two, except that it has, again, two more carbon atoms, even than caprylic acid. A dog that had never met capric acid would perhaps have no more trouble imagining its smell than we would have trouble imagining a trumpet, say, playing one note higher than we've ever heard a trumpet play before. It seems to me entirely reasonable to guess that a dog or a rhinoceros might treat mixtures of smells as harmonious chords, the way a sensitive musician hears notes. Maybe there are discords, probably not melodies, because that depends upon accurate timing, and smells have less precise timing. So once again, the perceptions that we call colors are tools the hues that we see are tools used by our brains to label important distinctions in our world. And in our world, the important distinctions happen to be between light of different wavelengths. They're labels which are available to the brain when it constructs its model of reality to make distinctions which are important for that animal, for its way of life. And in the bat's case, I speculate it might be surfaces of different uh, echoic properties or textures, in a rhino's case or a dog's case, why might it not be smells? Do rhinos smell in color? Middle world, the range of sizes and speeds which we've evolved to feel intuitively comfortable with, is a bit like the narrow range of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see as light of different colors. You can make a similar scale, all sorts of similar scales. You can make one of improbabilities, a spectrum of improbabilities. Nothing is totally impossible. Miracles are just events that are extremely improbable. A statue could wave its hand at us. The atoms that make up its crystalline structure are all vibrating backwards and forwards anyway. Because there are so many of them and there's no agreed preference in their direction of movement, the the marble, the stone of the statue, as we see it in Middle World, stays rock steady. But by sheer chance, the atoms in the hand could all just happen to move in the same direction at the same time, and again and again. In this case, the hand would move, and we'd see it waving at us in Middle World. It could happen, but the odds against are so great that if you set out writing zeros at the origin of the universe, you still would not have written enough zeros to this day in writing out the odds. Evolution in middle world has not equipped us to handle and understand very improbable events. In the vastness of astronomical space or of geological time, that which seems impossible in middle world might turn out to be inevitable. So let's think for a moment about the role of improbability in the evolution of life. 
Natural selection produces living organisms which are entities of gigantic but not infinite improbability. And it does it, not, by the way, by violating the second law of thermodynamics. Nothing does that. Um, Arthur Eddington, just a lovely little quote from Eddington, who said this on the subject of the second law of thermodynamics. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. If it is found to be contradicted by observation, well, these experimentalists do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. So if anybody tells you that evolution violates the second law of thermodynamics, they're talking nonsense. It no more violates the second law than an aeroplane or a pigeon violates the law of gravity. The pigeon and the plane do active work to stay aloft in spite of the continued presence of gravity. Natural selection does active work to drive evolution towards ever more dizzying heights of improbability in spite of the second law. And it does it by gradual cumulative steps, a long, slow ramp in which no one step is particularly improbable, slightly improbable, but not very. But the end result, if you think of it without the intervening ramp, the intervening cascade of steps upon steps upon steps, it turns out to be ludicrously improbable. So something like an eye or a bacterial flagellum, these poster boy organs or organelles of the creationist movement, nowadays sometimes called intelligent design, is the end product of a long cascade of cumulative selection. And the end product is staggeringly improbable, but each step was not all that improbable. So ordinary natural selection does not require us to postulate great feats of improbability, only modest ones. But are there some steps in the process of life which demand really major leaps of improbability? A revealing way to think about probabilities and improbabilities is by counting planets. Nobody knows how many planets there are in the universe, but a good estimate is probably about 10 to the 20 or 100 billion billion. And that gives us a nice way to re-express our estimate of life's improbability. We can, just as we did for the spectrum of wavelengths with our little narrow window, we can imagine a spectrum of improbabilities. And we can think about the, the probability of the origin of life, a various range of theories about how life might have originated. At one extreme would be that the origin of life was such a probable event that it happens on average once per planet in the universe. Well, if that were true, the universe would be simply crawling with life and we should long ago have been visited or have at least received radio transmission. Life originates once per star, much the same. Life originates once per galaxy. Well, that's very, very, very improbable indeed because the number of, of um, planets in a galaxy is stupefyingly large. But if life does originate only once per galaxy, in other words, if the origin of life is a quite ludicrously improbable event such that all chemists are wasting their time doing research on it or even thinking about it, if it's that improbable, yet because we are here and we are manifestly alive, life could still be as improbable as that and yet we would have an absolutely satisfying explanation for our own existence. Because if there is only one planet in the galaxy which houses life, then that planet has to be this one, since here we are. That's a version of the anthropic principle. Or even life might have originated once in the universe. The origin of life might have been the kind of chemical event which is so comically, ludicrously improbable. I mean, any chemist would just die laughing at the thought of such a thing happening. Nevertheless, because there are so many planets in the, in the universe and because we are here, the anthropic principle allows us to be satisfied by such a, an improbable chemical hypothesis. This is way off the radar, way off, way off the scale of improbabilities that our brains evolved in middle world are capable of dealing with. It comes into the category of the impossible. 
Then there are things which are even worse than that, um, which I've symbolized by a frog turns into a prince. By the way, before leaving that little um, thought about the improbability of the origin of life, I don't for one moment think that the, impro- that the origin of life was that improbable. In other words, I think there is life dotted around in the universe. What I am saying is that it, it is possible that chemists are wasting their time trying to speculate and trying to do experiments on the origin of life. The National Science Foundation, or whatever the Canadian equivalent is, would laugh at any chemist who proposed a research program which had a chance of only one in a hundred of succeeding. And we're talking about one in a hundred billion billion. So I'm saying there is a mismatch between the our judgment of what is a plausible scientific theory, because our judgment of, the, of what's plausible is honed by our evolution in middle world. We cannot use that kind of judgment in deciding what is a plausible theory for something that only had to happen once, like the origin of life. We're not allowed to use that sort of anthropic reasoning for the beauties and elegance of the millions of species we see around us, because that's an ongoing recurrent phenomenon, not a one-off. How shall we interpret queerer than we can suppose? Queerer than can in principle be supposed, or just queerer than we can suppose, given the limitation of our brain's evolutionary apprenticeship in middle world? Could we, by training and practice, emancipate ourselves from middle world, achieve some sort of intuitive, as well as just mathematical, understanding of the very small, the very large, and the very improbable? I genuinely don't know the answer. But I wonder whether we could help ourselves to understand, for example, quantum theory if we brought children up on computer games, which were, I mean, what if we had a computer game, a make-believe world of balls going through slits on screens, a world in which the strange goings-on of quantum mechanics were enlarged by the computer's make-believe so that they occurred before the child's eyes on the middle world scale of the screen. Or how about a relativistic computer game in which objects on the screen manifest the Lorentz contraction when they approach some maximum speed allowed by the rules of the computer game. It wouldn't be the speed of light. It would have to be arbitrarily set in the computer game. I don't know if that's been done. It would be fun to try. I want to end by applying the idea of middle world to our perceptions of each other. Most scientists today subscribe to a mechanistic view of the mind. We are the way we are because our brains are wired up as they are, our hormones are as they are, and so on. We would be different, our characters would be different if our neuroanatomy and our physiological chemistry were changed. But we're not consistent about our mechanistic worldview. If we were, if we scientists were consistent about that, our response to a misbehaving person, like a horrible mass murderer or a child murder or something, should be something like this. This unit has a faulty component. It needs repairing. But that's not what we say. We say, and I include myself as one of the worst, we're much more likely to say something like, vile monster, prison is too good for you, or something like that. Or worse, we seek revenge, thereby in all probability triggering the next phase in an escalating cycle of counter-revenge, the sort of thing we see in trouble spots around the world. In short, when we're thinking like academics, we regard people as elaborate and complicated computers or cars. But when we revert to being human, we behave more like Basil (laughs) Fawlty. On gourmet night, in a frantic hurry, his car died and refused to restart. He gave it fair warning, counted to three, gave it one more chance and then acted. Right, I warned you, you've had it coming to you. He got out of the car, seized a tree branch, and set about thrashing the car within an inch of its life. In 480 BC, the Persian king Xerxes sentenced the waves to 300 lashes after they wrecked his bridge of ships. When he then branded the sea with hot irons, he fancied that the hissing sounds were its cries of pain. Well, computers are much more complicated than cars, and I think we've all um, been there with our computers and felt like thrashing them. 
The reason we personify things like cars and computers is that just as monkeys live in an arboreal world and need, to, need software to simulate it, and moles live in an underground world, and water boatmen live in a surface tension-dominated flatland, we live in a social world. We swim through a sea of people, a social version of middle world. It's our natural way of life to deal with people every minute of a typical day. We are evolved to second-guess the behavior of others by becoming brilliant, intuitive psychologists. Treating people as machines may be philosophically and scientifically accurate, but it's a cumbersome waste of time if you want to guess what this person is going to do next or what this saber-toothed tiger is going to do next, for that matter. The economically useful way to model a person is to treat him as a purposeful, goal-seeking agent with pleasures and pains, desires and intentions, guilt and blameworthiness. Personification the imputing of intentional purpose is such a brilliantly successful way to model humans. It's hardly surprising that it sometimes misfires and we apply it to such things as cars, computers, or indeed the universe. So if the universe is queerer than we can suppose, it's because we have been naturally selected to suppose only what we ever needed to suppose in order to survive in the Pleistocene in Africa. That's the thesis I've been ad adopting. But are our brains, as a matter of fact, so versatile and expandable that we could train ourselves to break out of the box of our evolution? Finally, are there some things in the universe that are so queer that no philosophy of beings, however godlike, could dream them. Thank you very much. At the end of his lecture, Richard Dawkins took a few questions from the audience at the Mount Royal Center in downtown Montreal. The hall was packed. Over 800 people came to hear him speak. In the realm of biology, Dawkins has rock star status. People were very keen to hear him speak about his new book, The God Delusion. You're okay with questions, right? Could you talk about God just a little bit, please? Because I came for that and I didn't hear much said about God. Oh, you wanted me to talk about God? I yes. thought I wasn't supposed to talk about God. <laughs> I, I have written a book about God which has just come out called The God Delusion. And its thesis is first that God doesn't exist, and it would be better if people realized that. Just as I was waiting to give this talk, um, somebody told me, I hadn't seen this, that after the 9-11 atrocity, there was a graffito, I think it must have been, which said, Dear God, save us from those who believe in you. Dr. Dawkins, are we to presume that our dysfunctional behavior as a species serves an evolutionary purpose in that we have decided that we've made such a muck of things that we deserve to extinguish ourselves. <laughs> well, that's a nice talking point. Evolution doesn't uh, anticipate what would be best for the planet. That's not the way it works. Uh, it works by favoring that which is best for the individual's genes within populations within each species. And so any suggestion that we are about to extinguish ourselves and it would be the better for the planet, though it may be true, um, would not be an evolutionary mechanism. It would be an accident like most other extinctions that have happened throughout the history of life. Thank you. I'm an agnostic. My wife is an atheist. That's my premise in life. I can't be arrogant enough to say that I'm an atheist because I'm also a humanist and a scientist. What would be your comment on that one? Yes, that, that's a very interesting one, and, and it's one that worries a lot of people. In a way, the thing about being arrogant enough to decide that you know applies rather more to religious people because they really do seem to think that they know on the basis of no evidence. But one has, does have to, def to defend, you're quite right, atheists against an agnostic charge that atheists are, ag are, are arrogant because they think they know it all. When you think about it, we are all 
atheists when it comes to the vast majority of gods that have ever been proposed. Just about everybody in the world today is an a-thorist who doesn't believe in Thor with his hammer. We are a-Zeusists. We are a-Apolloists. We are a-Poseidonists. Nobody believes in any of those gods. And it's, they're not thought arrogant for not believing in those gods. It's a sort of odd thing that you are arrogant if you don't believe in something which, as it happens, lots of other people believe in, even if there's no more reason for them to believe in it, in this case, Yahweh, Jesus, Allah, whatever it might be, um, than there ever was to believe in Zeus or Poseidon. On Ideas, you've been listening to Richard Dawkins and the McGill University Beatty Memorial Lecture.